Hi everybody, I'm streaming from home. It's Friday night and I want you to let me know if you can hear me because I have absolutely no idea. I've got my camera set up. I have my at home green screen and we're gonna talk about all this coronavirus nonsense. Yesterday, my birthday, I was 46 years old and it was a terribly depressing Hi, day. Hi everybody, I'm streaming ah! from home. It's Friday I night. Turn and this audio off. I want you to turn that off. If you can hear me, because mm. I have absolutely no idea. I've got my Let's camera set up. make that pause. I have my Here we go. at home green screen. Uh, so let me and check and see if anybody can all this coronavirus let me know nonsense. if this is working yesterday, audio good says tackle the world so yesterday was super depressing, depressing. number right. one I'm my ah, little girls that are my this team audio off. for odyssey, odyssey of the mind yeah, they have me. built mm. these amazing vehicles yeah, and last weekend was their pause. regional yeah. odyssey of the mind competition uh, and uh, so one they're getting to go to states they're so excited they're going to get to know if this is working audio good says tackle the world so yesterday was super depressing number one Team, the first Three. robotics Girls competition, and, and those guys team. burn up a lot of money. We mind. donate they to them uh, and amazing canceled and after they arrived the at the place. The, the, the local uh, college so set it all up. And then, to uh, sorry, so county says go, go home. Stay in so it's been really depressing. You know, all sports are canceled. Anything that got just canceled, and that that really creates this feeling of fear, and it makes everything feel really scary. And it's hard to know. Canceled. whether or After not arrived, you're looking at an like overreaction or whether you're looking at the uh, tip of the iceberg. Should you freak Stay out? So it's been really depressing. The world and you're not for cancer. And that's why I wanted to do this stream just as a molecular biologist to kind of help that you really create figure out uh, how to navigate these really scary, scary things. And so there's three things that I've been thinking about. And the audio is looping on itself. Or whether you're looking at the tip of the iceberg. Good. Should you freak out? So it's been really mm -hmm. world and you're not for cancer. That's why I wanted to it do it. stream keeps uh, adding an, an additional audio stream every 30 seconds uh, how to navigate these really scary things. Mm. So there's three things that I've been thinking about. Let's see, what could it oh let's see. Audio is that better? Alright, I think I found the fault. Let me make sure all of these are minimized except for one. Let's see. Yep. All right, I'm gonna, uh, this, so this is a new OBS setup, new camera, new camera microphone. So that's a little bit differently than the way I use the stream. <laughs> and there's the lovely sound of underdog. So let me, uh, I know that, that chat is on a little bit of a delay. <laughs> Holy crap. Yes, <laughs> underdog, underdog has, <laughs> underdog is still, I'm pretty sure underdog has the coronavirus. He's definitely dog patient zero. Much better. Okay, fantastic. Um, mute the tab you have that is your stream. That is already done. It was two, there were two audio things. All right, so let's refresh. I wanted to do this stream because it's such a scary thing to process when the whole world is shutting down. And really for, for the first time in our modern memory, you know, it really seems like a, seems like the sky is falling and it's hard to know whether or not in a culture of fake news and media just hyping up everything because they're trying to fight for clicks it's hard to know what is when you should really be concerned and when you are when you should just ignore things so that's what i'd like to help you guys uh figure out just by giving you my thoughts and my take on this stuff so here is my three things number one so this is number one. Number one, no crowds. No crowds is a good thing. So here's why. I love this graphic that you guys have probably seen going around today and yesterday. And I first saw it shared by a friend of mine, Hutton, who works for the Mayo Clinic. And I think she's really smart. And she, uh, she showed me this graphic that tells us, and you can see it right here, that tells us that history shows us we've walked this walk before, even though none of us can remember it. But in as recent, many times, but as recently 
1918, there was another great big virus. There was another massive, massive pandemic where tons and tons and tons and tons of people died and they would use phrases like bodies stacked up like cordwood. And it was a really big deal. And when you look at this graph, you can kind of think of a tale of two cities. So the red one is what happened in Philadelphia, where Philadelphia was late to shutting stuff down like we are now. Philadelphia was like, yeah, 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 don't, don't cough on somebody, you know, use a handkerchief, but we're still gonna have the parade. So Philadelphia had the biggest parade, this big war parade, and two days later, every single one of their hospital beds was filled, and tons and tons, thousands and thousands of people died because they let there be a crowd. You know, and I was talking about with my girls today, like if you found out that you had corona, coronavirus, think back to like, who might you have spread it to? And they would think, okay, my family, the kids on the OM team, but really the two big things were, I would have potentially spread it to anybody at our regional OM con competition. Well, that's a lot of people. And anybody at school. Well, that's a lot of people as well. But outside of that, my girls don't really hang out with tons and tons and tons of people. So if you just eliminate crowds, then you really, 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 really dramatically cut down on this ability to spread a virus during that time where we don't really know that we're actually sick. So no crowds is a really good idea. And you can see on the blue that that's what Chicago did. They were quick, no crowds. And they have the exact same kind of rules that we are seeing, uh, that we are seeing now. Like I love this little blurb from Chicago in 1918 that says, don't talk to my face, don't shake my hands, cough, sneeze, and spit into your handkerchief and stay home if you have a cold. Yeah, this is the same stuff that we're saying now. This is, this is not new and scary. This is something that comes along every now and then, and it will again. So, no crowds, I think, is a really, is my advice number one. And as you look at all these cancellations, they feel so scary and you feel like, I gotta, I gotta, the world is falling and I need to go buy toilet paper and I need to go uh, freak out because there's nothing for sale at the grocery store. Ah, really, all of this stuff is just one thing. No crowds. That's it. It's just no crowds. Okay, no crowds. Nothing wrong with no crowds. Just do it. All right. Now, number two. So let's go over here to number two. And here's my number two. Number two. <laughs> number two is don't touch, don't touch your face, seriously. Don't touch your face, seriously. Now don't touch your face, number two, goes along with these other things that we'll just call like germ hygiene. And this stuff is really, really hard. So you have to become really vigilant about, let's just not, let's wash our hands and don't touch your face. I was so struck when I got on a plane and I went to Maryland two days ago to testify for the right to repair legislative hearing in Maryland, my home state, I was thrilled to go. So I got on a plane and I didn't know what it was going to be like. What's it like to go on an airplane today? You know, is it, what's it like? And I was really surprised. I went to the airport and I was prepared and I'm super laid back, but I was prepared. I had a hoodie with front pockets and I had a um, pile of tissues and paper towels. And then I had to spray alcohol uh, alcohol dispenser. And I think I'll put a link to that because that actually was really, really helpful for, for traveling. So I had those things and I went to the airport and I made sure I kind of entered vigilant mode because I know for sure that somebody had this virus that walked through this airport just two days before. And that was our first case here in Rochester. I don't want to bring this virus back home to my parents and grandparents who they have uh, maybe a 15% chance of dying if they just get the disease. So that's really scary. So I got on the plane and I sat next to, to, to a guy and he was coughing. That is so not cool. He was coughing and I noticed that he made no attempt to cover his cough at all. That's, that's crazy. What is wrong with you? 
And I didn't say anything like, what the fuck? <laughs> I didn't punch him in the face. It was really crazy. And then I, I remember he, he coughed eight times during this short little one hour flight. And one time he even touched my arm and I almost decked him. Like you can't do that. So you have to be really vigilant with this rule number two. I was the only one that was spraying down my airplane seat like you're supposed to do. And then when I got to the actual state house in my beloved home, home state, people were, I was the only one that was touching elevator buttons with a, with a pen or making somebody else to it. <laughs> like, I'm not gonna touch an elevator button anymore. This kind of germ vigilance, you know, just kind of see them everywhere, everywhere you go, and it's pretty easy to adapt to that. Just carry a couple things. Carry a pen to punch buttons, carry a tissue so that whenever, and at your shop, put this out. You know, I told my team long ago, put out paper towels so that nobody has to touch a door handle. Use a paper towel, open the door, and then put a trash can right there inside and outside of every door, very easy. So you don't wanna to be touching community surfaces. So germ hygiene, if somebody gives you a credit card, smile at them, take out, hold this little spray bottle of alcohol, spray, 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 wipe it off. Everybody's happy, everybody gets it. Germ hygiene, I think that's really important. And while I was there, I was, I was surprised that, that people weren't taking this very seriously. And that was really concerning, especially because I had my dad come up to this hearing. My dad was helping to testify for the right to repair. I feel like I kind of put my dad at risk and I really don't like that. You know, dude, please cover your cough. Yeah, it was, you know, it was really concerning. So, I mean, I feel like I kind of put my dad in harm's way and I, I feel pretty guilty about that, you know, so, I wanted to show you this when I was, oh, my, my, uh, my little thing isn't moved over right. Let's see if I can fix that. Yeah, there we go. There we go. No crowds. Don't touch your face seriously. All right, here's, here's the thing. So we're taping this right to repair hearing and I have a camera and I'm it's exhausting, it's hours and hours and hours, and you're videotaping all of this testimony. And I just had this moment where I'm looking through the camera and I'm, and I'm sort of panning down the row of legislators and I'm noticing how many times these people are just sitting there doing their job, touching their face. And I made a little clip so that you could see. Let me know if this clip works out. Uh, that question be addressed to uh, the Hopefully subsequent panels of manufacturers directly. Look at that. Ladies, and, and what about that's qualified to answer your question. That guy. Okay. And what about the other heavy equipment that you're talking about? Essentially power tools and outdoor power equipment, which are, you know, have safety implications just because they shouldn't be placed. That guy, number four. Most uh, the we the do and most of the members of the industry currently provide assemblies that are available to owners of the products to have to have replace the equipment that they have 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 that they assemblies that are faulty in their equipment. So they can bring their equipment back up to the original operational condition. You know, do this other thing. I'm going to play that again because I think that's cool. Uh, uh, that you question know, that to when the subsequent panels of manufacturers directly. Actually, you know, and what about the video? Was 23 times and what about the other heavy equipment that you're talking about? Essentially power tools and outdoor power equipment which are you know, have safety implications just because they should be placed into that nature. And then you absent most, uh, we do, and most members of the industry you know, currently provide assemblies that are, are available to owners of products to, to replace assemblies that are faulty in their equipment. So they can bring their equipment back up to original operational condition. Like, I really will, as laid back as I am, as, you know, my car keys are sitting in my minivan right now, you can come and get it. You know, super, super laid back, but I am going to uh, carry around a little alcohol spray and I will not touch a door handle. I will not touch an elevator button. And even people's phones, when somebody gives me a phone that they've recently had, I'm going to, I'm, I'm not going to touch somebody's phone without spraying alcohol on it and cleaning it off. Or some kind of a wipe, got to get rid of that bacteria. We'll talk about that as well. All right. So let's talk about um, 
Background video is too loud and your mic is too low. We can't hear you over the video. Okay. Well, that video is done. Mm, no audio now? Yeah, you should be able to hear me. Can you hear me now? Yeah, that video is done. There. Is that better? Does it get muted when the video is still on there? I clean really good my hearing aids. Insert video too loud. Hmm. Yeah, one of the OBS things is I can't hear that video. And I spent, I don't know, <laughs> I've spent most of today kind of figuring out how to set this stuff up. Man, it's frustrating. OBS appears to, it definitely doesn't have a straightforward way so that I can hear a video. Like I can see it, but I can't hear it. I can see that it has sound, but I can't hear the sound. It doesn't, it only plays to the stream, which is crazy. Okay, good. All right. So number three, this is number three. Let's get to number three is I think also really, really important business as usual. No, no fear mongering. All right. So number three, business as usual. So I've, I've, you know, I've, I've had people ask me, Jessa, are you going to cancel your March board repair school? No, I'm not going to cancel March board repair school. And I, and I'm not only not going to cancel it. I think it's really important to not cancel it or anything that's like that right now. There's so much cancellation and economic instability for things that we have to do as part of rule number one, no crowds. That's really going to put a damper on a lot of industry and a lot of jobs that people depend on. So if you have something that is, you know, that is work related, small group, you definitely want to do that. That's the stuff to keep because you still need to live your life and you need to have business as usual. You need to go to the post office. You need to, you know, keep your doors open. You need to support your local community. I heard a really good idea where somebody said, go around to local businesses and buy a gift card to kind of help them with cash flow during this sort of difficult time of no crowds. So that, you know, later on you can kind of go back and enjoy a nice time. That's a really good idea. We need to do whatever we can to support the people that are in these service industries, airline and travel and restaurants, you know, they're really going to be hurting. So you want to continue to live your life because here's the deal. If we think back to this flatten the curve idea, we want to see the blue we need to we've it's it's we've we've passed the time where we could eliminate this virus that's not going to happen the virus is too too seeded into our population there's no chance that we're going to be able to just eliminate it from our population in the next couple of years that's not going to happen so it's going to percolate through our population. It's going to affect all of us. Now, how fast or slow is really up to us. And that's what these two curves mean. If we just throw caution to the wind and we say things like, ah, oh, it's just a flu. It's just, a, you know how many people kill the flu? You know, the flu kills a lot, blah, blah, blah. If we keep that attitude, and I heard somebody say something yesterday. Well, I touch the elevator, but you know, I keep my immune system up. That's not how it works. Your body has never been exposed to the antigen that's in this new, brand new virus. You can't, you know, it doesn't work like that. So if you throw caution to the wind and you just, you know, don't, don't care at all, then you're contributing to the wildfire-like spread of this virus that's going to overwhelm our ability to have enough medical support for the people that really, really need it. So don't do that. Don't be the guy in red. But on the other hand, if you just kind of go into your house and shut the door and just eat your stockpile hoard of ramen and wipe your ass with leaves, 
for you know indefinitely then you're not letting the blue happen either we we have to have this gentle and mild community spread because think about it if you don't if we if we don't allow this virus to kind of spread through the community at a at a moderate rate then we're going to have a lot more serious economic collapse and it could even be just as bad as being in the red curve right because people that are uh in the gig economy you know people that are uh hourly workers people that are really living hand to mouth people that don't have any contingency plan people that don't have uh, family support for child care they are really going to be hurting so we need to keep it really tight you know as uh, like a couple weeks, a month, you know, to just sort of allow this virus to kind of come into our community in a controlled way. It's kind of like, you know, turning on a fire hose and just letting it kind of come out, but not kill us, right? We're trying to do that and we have to do that. So I think business as usual is really important for that economic stability. And we can't overlook that. We can't, it's not okay to just kind of go inside your house and lock the door and just kind of depend on the rest of the world. At least that's what I think. That's, that's my opinion. So part of that is no fear mongering, right? Because if you keep fear mongering, then that's going to drive people to hoard. It's going to drive people to stay inside and to have no, you know, or very, to, to lower the rate of transmission to super, super low so that we have to keep up the no crowds for six months. That will really, that's gonna kill people. You know, if, if, if it comes to that, if we make it so slow that this is six months long, then, you know, I think that that's also, that's gonna really, really hurt people. So no fear mongering. And I wanted to talk to you guys. Um, uh, I wish 99% of news anchors had as much common sense as you, Jessa. All right, so here's the deal. And I'm going to answer chat questions in just a second. But the no fear mongering part, I wanted to go through a little example because I want all of you guys to feel empowered to understand, read, and weigh information and figure stuff out for yourself. So let's do an example. Here is, oh yeah. Here was the, here's the page where they're, I found out they're actually closing Maryland. This was pretty funny. I just found out this today. Maryland, you know, I was just there and this is where everybody's touching their face and no, and sh they're still shaking hands. Like I had to say, no, I'm not letting you infect me. <laughs> this was my handshake. <laughs> Trump, stop trying to kill me. <laughs> That's what you do with somebody. When Donald Trump tries to shake your hand, you say, <laughs> stop trying to kill me, old man. I'm not having it. That's how you respond to the to the uh, handshake when you feel like I don't know what to do. So here in Maryland, the General Assembly, all rallies and receptions will be canceled starting Friday. And beginning next week, the thing I just went to, all bill hearings, they're only going to hear in-person testimony from the bill's sponsor. So we couldn't even go. And members of the public are encouraged to submit your written testimony. So do it, guys. It's still open. You know, you still have a chance. Send those letters. Send an email. Pick up a phone and call your representative and kind of tell them, have a, have a more uh, long, lengthy, in, you know, interesting conversation about repair. So definitely do that. That's a little bit of an aside. All right. This is what I want to show you guys about no fear mongering. Rule number three, business as usual, with no fear mongering. Here's a Facebook post that floated around. Now, this is a while ago. But there were a bunch of these, you know, this is, this is fear mongering. Be careful if you order anything from China, careful with your packages because according to Rebecca Eldridge, the virus can live on a surface for 28 days. So even if the person sneezed or wiped their grammar police nose and touched the parcel, it can be affected up to 28 days. Also, anybody that has grammar like that, just ignore whatever they say. They don't have attention to detail, bro. And therefore, they're not likely to pick up on nuance such as you're repeating pseudoscience that doesn't make any sense. That's just another opinion. All right, but this kind of stuff, it's really, it's, it's like the rice myth, right? It seems plausible. Like, oh, really? I didn't know the virus could live for, is that true? It can live for 28 days? Oh my God, that's fair mongering. Ah! So when you come across things like this, and these are rampant, then I want you to have the tools to just ask a question. I'll be the judge of that, right? 
I mean, it's, it happened at work the other day. Katrina told me, Jessa, did you know that Mountain Dew is going to stop making Mountain Dew? No, they're not. Why would they? That doesn't make any sense. Why? Oh, because it's bad for you. So, what? That's not a, that, no company ever decided to stop marketing a lucrative product because it was bad for you. They're compelled to stop making things uh, bad for you if they make money. That doesn't make sense. So, we, we looked it up and, of course, it was false. So, here's what I want you guys to be able to do. I want for you guys to be able to do something like this. So I thought this was kind of fun. So if you if you look to see where this idea come from that these viruses may be able to live for 28 days, then it doesn't take very long to drill down. I think AccuWeather had an article and there's a you know medical science blog out there that, that has an article and they all point back to this study. So let's walk through it for like 10 seconds, right? Let's just kind of glance. Let's not be afraid to look at things that look like this, right? So this is this is a paper. And I want for you guys to, to just say, oh, let's give it a shot. This is not a whole lot different than looking at a schematic, right? A schematic is like, I don't know what to make of this. Look, just give it a try, right? Look at a chip. You can see like, how's this thing? How's this thing pretty much plugged into the wall? Probably the big dark line at the top. You know, what's this, what's the output? Oh, probably the one that says out. What's the input? Oh, probably the skinny little ones that look like they go to the CPU. Right, you can kind of figure, figure that stuff up. Um, uh, so, let's see. I must be really infected, so many packages, yes. Uh, let's give it a try, all right? Let's see what these guys say. So whenever you look at an article, the first thing to do is to say who wrote it and when and who pays those people. All right, so we can see the authors here and we could, you know, look to see their affiliations. I don't know what Plum X metrics are. And we can look to see article info. And that's really important. All right, so when was this published? So this was, they, they turned it in on January 31st. So then that kind of puts us in, all right, so January 31st, what was the world like back then? Back then, I had yet to buy spring break plane tickets to Italy and then I had yet to find out that Italy later went on to, be can to become the Wuhan of Europe, and I had yet to <laughs> have to cancel that entire trip. That's ancient history. January 31st, you can barely remember it. All right, so that's when this, uh, this uh, was written, right? So what is it? This is a review article. So you can kind of read in here um, what they did. So let's see. We reviewed the literature on all available information. All right, so we reviewed the literature. Let me make that so that you guys can see the whole thing of it. Ah, come on. Here we go. All right, so we reviewed the literature and that makes this not a research article, but a review article. And there's nothing wrong with review articles, but they're not doing their own research. What they're trying to do is, as professional scientists, look at, okay, what's everything that we already know? Let me read all these different papers and see what I can do to kind of compare. Uh, they did this study, they did another one almost like it, but theirs only used half as much sample, so how can I combine these together? Are they really two different? That's what a review article attempts to do, sort of summarize a body of research. And you can find lots of different review articles that are out here. So these guys went out to do a review article. So let's see, um, 22 studies. And they looked for all of these different, th these different coronaviruses. And they wanted to, to see what kind of papers are out there. Who's already done research on coronaviruses? Now this is all going to predate our coronavirus, right? This is from before. So they're saying, what do we already know about coronaviruses in general? And this is what they found out. So they've kind of got this like uh, summary, which says, we found that most of these viruses that can affect people can live on surfaces for up to nine days. And can be effectively inactivated by, so you can kill them off with wipes, right? Spritz, spritz, wipe, easy, or hydrogen peroxide, 
for this stuff, sodium hypochlorite. Anybody know what that is? Sodium hypochlorite bleach within one minute. So pretty easy to kill. All right, so now this is just a summary. We don't wanna just take their word for it. We're looking for the actual research and it doesn't take very much to actually find it, right? So here's the majority of the actual information that they're reporting on, table one, table one. Here it is. This is, this is the whole thing. So anything that you read all the way down to Rebecca Eldridge's Facebook post really comes back to this table. And that should be your goal. I'll be the judge of that. You show me the research. I'll make the conclusion. You show me the table. So let's do it. Let's give it a try. Let's see, what, let's see if we can make any sense of this at all. All right, let's see. Type of surface, steel, okay, versus some of the other studies, aluminum, metal, wood. All right, it's a bunch of different surfaces. All right, virus. All right, so we got all these different viruses. Now, if you, if you, we'd have to go on a deeper hunt to figure out, well, why would you guys use all these different ones? And I'll tell you why, because I went on a little bit of a hunt last night when I couldn't sleep at three o'clock in the morning, figuring out how I was going to tell the girls that the OM state competition has been canceled, just like everything else in the world. And so what I found out is that, uh, well, if you're going to do a study on the SARS virus or the MERS virus, uh, that shit's dangerous. So why don't you, instead of having to have a biosafety level three lab, why don't you use like a relative virus that doesn't infect humans? And that way it's really easy to work with and you can have less safety concerns as you're doing the work. So that's what they did. So these guys that use this uh, mouse, and I don't know, I don't know which one of these, probably this one is the murine hepatitis virus. That's probably the mouse virus. And I forget what TGEV is, but some other virus that does not affect humans because that makes it really safe to work with, right? But it also makes it less of a close relative to our coronavirus. All right, so we've got all these different viruses. They're all in the same family, though, coronaviruses. All right, strain isolate. Okay, so which flavor, chocolate, vanilla of the particular virus did you get for the study? Next, inoculum viral titer. This is a word that means, uh, okay, so you're trying to stick virus on something, go away, come back and say, how much is still there? So the inoculum is how much virus did you start out with? All right, and you can see these little numbers. 10 to the six is a million. 10 to the five is, is 10 times less than that, which is a lot. Okay, and then these guys were really studying temperature so there's a lot of variability where people would do these experiments like, well, what happens if I stick some virus on something? And then I make these very carefully controlled laboratory conditions. So I'm going to keep this little disc of virus that I put on a little steel disc. I'm going to put it at room temperature, but not just any room. I'm going to put it inside a case that's exactly 20 degrees so that everything is controlled and it's kept very similar. So I can keep everything the same and just see if that thing can live. And I'll do that three times, keep everything the same, because that's how science works. So that's a really big far cry from just saying, I'm gonna spit on my hand and I'm gonna wipe it on this pair of pants and I'm gonna come back and see if I can get the virus out of those pants in nine days or 28 days or whatever. Right? These are really, really tightly controlled conditions that are not the same as what a package would really experience on a boat from China to Rochester, New York. All right, so then you can kind of see they played with temperature. And then here's the, here's the money, persistence. So what they did is all of these guys and whatever their little studies were, they would put some virus on something put it somewhere, control everything about it, and then they would come back and they would take the thing and like stick it in a drop of, you know, Fruit Loops, let it get all juicy, and then they would infect these plates with it and see whether or not any virus was still there. And you could see the virus was there by seeing little plaques where the virus chews up the cells. And they would count the plaques. All right, so then they would see, how long could we still see that the virus was still alive, that we could still see some activity? Now that activity, how much, you know, there's, there's, there might just be like, yeah, there's like one live virus, but millions and millions, all the other million were dead, but one of them was still alive. 
versus most of them were alive, right? So that doesn't show up here in these results. So let's see what they are. Let's kind of get a, get a sense. Let's just from far away get a sense of the range, all right? So the MERS virus, it looks like at 20 degrees Celsius is kind of more or less a room temperature. It's like a cold room, a little bit chilly. 48 hours, okay. That's probably what you would expect, right? Hours to a couple days, hours to days. And this one, if you heat it up a little bit more, so 30 degrees is kind of a warm, kind of like getting a little hot, then, oh look, it only lives half as long in that study. All right, then here comes this one. This one's kind of a, an outlier though. Look at that, 28 days. And then the same group, this is group paper, writing paper number 22, that we have uh, whatever this doesn't infect humans virus is, it looks like you can still grow it if it's super cold, like in a refrigerator, that's four degrees. Very, very cold. If you keep it very cold, very stable, very steady. So chill it down, like freeze it, like cool, not freezing, four degrees. Get it super, super cold. That sucker will still be there 28 days later, at least in some tiny quantity. Now, if you raise up the temperature to room temperature, hey, look at that. They now had this weird range. Some of the samples died out after three days, but one of them still lived for the whole 28 days. And then 40 degrees, uh, 40 degrees is hot. Well, if you heat it up to 40 degrees, look at that. Dies off hours to days. All right, also 22, they did the same thing. These guys kind of got the same kind of results, these 28 day studies. What about everybody else? Group 23, five days, two, two to eight hours. Uh, five days, five days, four days, 24, four days, five days, 48 hours, four days, six days, two to six, five, two, 24 hours, one hour, five days. So if, what would you say if you had to just take all of this as that's everything we know about coronaviruses, now here's a new coronavirus that you've never seen. Now you predict how long does the new guy stay alive if I stick it on this parts box and send it to China. When it gets to China, will it still be infected? Uh, I would say pretty much no chance because in the highly controlled, in the highly controlled experimental, we're putting a million viral particles on each, on a spot. Most of these were dead within a couple of days. Most of them within a couple of hours, but by, by five, maybe nine days at the outside, except for these two kind of oddball cases. So then you could say, well, I want to know more about those two oddball cases. So then you can click here and you can drill down to the actual real paper. Well, tell me more about that. Why are you so weird, group 22? What's up with your paper? And we can click on it and we can get to the whole article and we can see what do these guys do? Well, who are they? Casanova. All right, Casanova uh, from University of North Carolina. Well, that sounds like a reasonable a reasonable place that smart thinking people would go to do research. And now we can read and see exactly what they did. View full text. Yeah, because what am I looking for? Where's your results table, bro? I want to see it. And so we can kind of re read in here, read in here. And I'm looking for table, right? And we can read about all of this other stuff. And, and here we can finally get to the table. All right, here we go. Figure one. Yeah, let's, let's, Let's do open in a new tab. Why not? Does that still show up over here? Not very well. Let's go back. Let's go back over here. All right, so now we can see inactivation of whatever this weird coronavirus is that, that doesn't affect people. And the mouse one over time was measured for different combinations of ambient temperature and relative humidity and they have this figure one. So they're gonna tell us, if you make it really cold at four degrees, infectious virus deposited on stainless steel surfaces, these little disks, at initial levels of a whole bunch, persisted for as long as 28 days. 
and the lowest level of inactivation over 28 days took place at 20% relative humidity. So what does that mean? The lowest level of inactivation, meaning hardly any of them were killed, hardly any of them were inactivated if the humidity was really, really low. And that that's interesting, right? So we can kind of read a lot of this stuff and kind of uh, fig figure it all out. What these guys did that was kind of weird is that they had the this sort of odd result where, well, look, if you make it cold and you have no humidity, now those viruses will last forever. If it's not humid, it's almost like if you kind of like dry them out and keep it cold, they kind of go dormant and then they can still grow. Okay. But also, if you make it really humid, then you can sometimes grow them. So it had this like weird result that they couldn't really explain. I would expect them to repeat that with a large number and they didn't do that. They just kind of quit. So that was kind of weird. Like it, they, they, it was almost seemed like it was kind of incomplete when I looked at this. Anyway, the thing that was even more interesting about this study, I think it was, was it this one? Is they said, uh, well, how do we kill these things? Now these guys, I think, were the ones that were just growing it. But uh, back, let's go back to the review article. Where's the review article? Let's go back to the review article. It was more interesting than hey, you know, sometimes you can make something grow for twenty eight days, but it's super, super weird. They went on to say, what about killing them? Now this is not mentioned at all. Back at Rebecca Eld Eldridge's Eldridge's scare tactic 28 day Facebook post. She does not mention that the same review article teaches us that, look at this, inactivation of coronaviruses by biocidal agents, blah, blah, blah. So let's look and see. Let's look at this table, table two, inactivation, killing them. All right, how hard is it to kill these things? Let's see. What if you get some ethanol or let's just stick with stuff that we already have, isopropyl alcohol. We all have that, we use, they've got some right here. Look at that, you know, isopropyl alcohol right here, 99%. So what would happen if I had, let's just say 75% isopropyl alcohol and I had the real SARS, SARS, the one that actually infects people. And I uh, put it on there for 30 seconds, then I can reduce the viral infecti infectivity by more than four log 10. So that's, that is, if you read it, according to the people that did study number 14, you will not be able to culture the virus. So it's effectively killing it down to zero. So that's pretty good. Only 30 seconds. That's, that's pretty good. And you can look at all this other stuff. Everything really, really killed this stuff. Some of them, you know, it took 10 minutes. Well, that's too long. What else is in here? You can look in, what about bleach? We can even look to see which one, we can, we can get an answer to this question. Which should I use to clean my cell phone, alcohol or bleach? Well, let's see. If you use the alcohol, it looks like you can, let's say that the, the level that you wanna to get to is this level four, you know, more greater than or equal to a reduction of four orders of magnitude. So let's see, how does the bleach do? Well, let's see. Well, if I take bleach and I dilute it down to 0.2% bleach, that's mostly water, right? 0.2% bleach. And here's the tough and hardy mouse strain. Hey, that's that sucker that lives for 28 days. That's the one you got to worry about. That's the one that can live for 28 days. Look at this. You can kill it in 30 seconds so that you can't grow it at all with 0.2% bleach. Well then, let's go tell let's go tell Jessica. I bet she wants to know that. I mean, Re Rebecca. Hey, Rebecca, Rebecca, Rebecca Eldridge. Did you know that you don't have to worry about all of that? You know, like buying stuff from China and maybe it's still gonna have virus on it for 28 days. All you need to do is get a little spray bottle of a little bit of light bleach. <laughs> totally, totally kill the virus. Don't even worry about it. Uh, no, no big deal at all. And you can look at all this other stuff. Now this stuff seems really potent. Uh, povidone iodine, I had to look up that stuff. That's that orange stuff that you see people painting on, uh, oh, you're gonna have to get your appendix taken out. Here, we're gonna shave your belly and then we're gonna slap this stuff on it. 
that's what it is, the iodine. And this is the same stuff that like hikers used to put in water so that it would kill all the things. Look at this stuff, 4.65. This stuff in 15 seconds will kill this stuff super dead. Well, that's really the good stuff. Now, if you go and look on, on Amazon, this is why I did it like three o'clock in the morning last night. If you go look on Amazon, guess what Amazon is not sold out of? That stuff. That stuff that's even better than hand sanitizer. I mean, if you, it also is a self tanner. If you can go around having like nice little, you could, you could look like Donald Trump. Like a great stuff there. All right, that's the, that's the end of this. I wanted to just kind of give you guys a taste of, hey, yeah, I can go dive in here and I can learn a lot, actually, a lot more if I just jump in and I look for the actual results tables. And I'll just figure it out. I might have to Google a few things, but it can actually be pretty fun and you can learn a lot. And then you can be a person that's really able to educate people around you so that when your friend Rebecca Eldridge tell, tries to tell you this kind of fear-mongering stuff, you can say, ah, rule number three, rule number three, business as usual, I'm getting out there. You know, personally, I'm gonna get up and I'm gonna go to the YMCA tomorrow. But while I'm at the YMCA, I am not going to open the door. I am going to be really vigilant more so than I normally am. Normally I'm the kind of person that goes like, yeah, 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 you're not gonna, you're not gonna die from a drop of sweat. But now, yeah, you might die from a drop of sweat. I'm gonna wipe down the equipment more than I normally would, but I'm still gonna go. I'm gonna go and I'm gonna have a great time. And I, I, because it's important to have business as usual. And when I hear people talk about things in the locker room, like Rebecca, Eldridge might say, then I'm just gonna, you know, kind of let them know, yeah, you know, I actually looked into that a little bit and it turns out that, you know, X, Y, and Z is true. And that is what I wanted for you guys to, uh, to get out of this stream. So let's click over and see if anybody is, uh, has any questions for chat. And if not, then I will finish this glass of wine and go to bed. Wow. It's, it's midnight. What are you guys talking about in chat? Using alcohol would degrade the oleophobic present on most electronics. Guess it would be just for the best to get a full case like OG Otterbox LP and wipe that off instead of the phone dry. Funny you should ask. Uh, I've been using, you know, I, I put the Injured Gadgets Protection Pro on my phone and I can't stand like tempered glass, but I actually re I really like the, the feel of the Protection Pro. And with the Protection Pro on there, I really don't, it doesn't bother me at all to, you know, drop alcohol on there. You know, that, and I've been using a spritzer bottle of the um, Mrs. Meyers hand sanitizer that's just kind of like a, it's like spray um, alcohol. So I've really been liking that. Um, I, what are the experiment that I'm going to do maybe tomorrow, I've got a bunch of Petri dishes and we're going to inoculate some, uh, some, uh, phones and then we're going to do some different treatments and just kind of see how they all stack up. I'm sure all this stuff is going to kill fun. But what I really want to know, what my idea is that I want to try out is to get one of the UV lights, you know, the UV lights that everybody has and stick it in a box, you know, and kind of make